Hello and welcome to the next set of life sciences lessons in which we are looking at the history of life. We've already started looking at this topic. Today we are going to continue. Let's have a look at what we've already done. We have already looked at the history of life. We've looked at fossils. We've looked at timelines of the Earth. We've looked at the Cambrian explosion of life. And what we're going to look at today are mass extinctions. Concept map for this part of the lesson is all about mass extinctions. And we're going to have a look at when did they occur, why did they occur, and what effect did mass extinctions have on life on Earth? First of all, we have to remind ourselves what is a fossil. And a fossil is a hard part of an animal that lived many millions of years ago. Please remember, in most cases, the soft parts of a dead organism decay, leaving only the hard bits. So, of the vertebrates, most of what we found are actually bones, if we look at this example. But scientists have worked out from the bones exactly what the animal should look like. So any model you see is a scientific representation of what paleontologists think that animal would actually have looked like. Next thing, we have to revise the process of fossilization. In other words, how do fossils occur? It's very important to note that most of the animals that live and die on Earth never made it to become fossils because fossilization can only occur under very specific conditions. And this is what it is. First of all, the animal has to die. It then has to decay and the bones remain undisturbed as layer upon layer upon layer of sediment is laid down on top of the skeleton. Then, over millions of years, minerals percolate through the rock in the rainwater and replace the minerals in the bone and the bone actually becomes a fossil. And last of all, we have to know it's there and that happens when erosion occurs and the fossils are exposed. We then also looked at the geological time scale, which was looking at life over the past 600 or so million years and seeing how life has changed and the life in this time has been divided into three eras. The Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and the Cenozoic era. Please don't worry if you sometimes see Cenozoic and Paleozoic spelt slightly differently. That's not really important. You can use any one of the spellings. The important thing in looking at a geological time scale like this is we look at the pictures of animals and how much they have changed. And if we look at a geological time scale, we'll notice their lines. And if we look at the animals below the line and the animals above the line, they are totally, totally different. And the reason is those lines show things called mass extinctions, when many animals died out. And in the geological time scale, there have been five mass extinctions throughout geological time. If we have a look, first one is at the end of the Ordovician, then the Devonian, then the Permian then the Triassic period, and this is the one which we know the most about because that's the Cretaceous tertiary extinction, which is when the dinosaurs died out. Okay, and here is a picture of 
dinosaurs looking at strange things that are happening in the sky. And very soon after that, the dinosaurs became extinct. Oh, and when I talk about very soon, okay, this is geological time we're talking about. So speed in geological time means it takes about 2 million years. That's fast in geological time. Now, how do we classify what a mass extinction is? Okay, and first of all, it's where more than 50% of all known species die out or become extinct in a relatively short period of time. And a very interesting thing is 99% of all species that have ever existed on Earth are extinct. Now, this is a problem because when animals go extinct, lots and lots of them die. So what happens is the biodiversity of Earth is reduced. So mass extinctions reduce the biodiversity by killing off groups of species. But after these species have died, there is also a growth of other species. So after a mass extinction, we see a diversification of life. Okay, so if plants and animals in a habitat disappear, it creates new opportunities. And the animals have now got empty habitats, lots of resources, so those that have survived the mass extinction can actually thrive and diversify. Now, in your lessons, you might have looked at something like this. Okay, and what this is, this is a graph showing how the biodiversity of life has changed over the past 550 or so million years. Let's have a look at what it's actually telling us. So, if we look at this, we can see that the number of different groups of animals, in other words, the biodiversity, goes up and down. And there are five spots where there have been very, very big drops. And this one, the end Permian extinction, is the one that has created the biggest drop. In other words, it killed off the most species. But please note, after that, what happens? After each one, we find a spurt in the in increase in biodiversity. But before we go any further, I think it's time for a break to refresh your brains a bit. Welcome back. I hope your brains are feeling bright and ready to look at mass extinctions and how they actually occur. Now, what could possibly make a whole lot of animals become extinct? Well, scientists don't really know because there was nobody around at that time. So what scientists have done, they look at the evidence and from the evidence, fossil evidence, geological evidence, they've come up with three theories that could possibly explain these mass extinctions. Now, scientists differ on which one actually happened. So you will find some scientists saying, no, it's definitely the asteroid impact. Other scientists saying, no, it was volcanic eruption. Just bear in mind, nobody actually knows. And there's evidence for all three of those theories. So basically, you can choose the one you want to believe. This is an artist's impression 
of what happened at the time that asteroid hit. This is North America. This is the Gulf of Mexico. If we have a look at a map, that is the Yucatan Peninsula, and that is where the crater is, and the lines show how the monstrous tsunami spread across the whole of that Gulf of Mexico area. This is also an artist's impression showing the asteroid impact, the huge tsunami, and of course, if you have a look, something that big would cause a huge splash, and that's basically what caused the tsunami. Then, this part is very interesting because the asteroid was so hot that the rock where it hit actually melted. And the tsunami brought in a whole lot of debris, bits of different types of rock, which are now embedded in the molten rock, and they've actually found rocks like that at the impact site. And this is a picture of the actual crater. It's a satellite picture, and that crater is 110 kilometers across. And you can see from the look of it, it's definitely an impact crater. Now, what would the long-term effects be of this asteroid hitting the Earth, causing such huge disruption? And how could it actually lead to animals becoming extinct? There were several long-term results, and we're going to have a look at them. Okay, first of all, dust and sulfur was thrown into the atmosphere, so much so that the Earth was in total darkness for three months. And the results of that were catastrophic. First of all, a drop in temperature because there's no sunlight, death of plants because they couldn't photosynthesize, and because there are no plants, there's a drop in the oxygen level which would lead to the death of animals because of lack of food and oxygen. Next, because the asteroid was burning up, devastating fires, wildfires, spread across large areas of the earth, killing plants and animals. Third one, monstrous tsunamis swept animals over the earth. Then, because of the impact, the energy of the impact, the tectonic plates were unbalanced and that led to volcanic eruptions. Now, how do scientists actually say this happened? What evidence have they found? And the most important evidence is in the fossil record between the Mesozoic and Cenozoic sediments, there's a thin layer of clay containing an element, iridium. And if we look at the picture, that is this thin layer of iridium. And you might think, well, how does that say there was an asteroid? Iridium is an element that is rare on Earth, but common in asteroids. And the rocks above and below this had very, very little iridium in them. So scientists use that as an indication that there was something that came from outer space. Another piece of evidence is this is the rock from underneath the impact site. And you can see there's lots of different types of rocks, colored rocks of all different types, and they have been cemented together. Remember I said the very rock became molten. 
and these are now all cemented together, and that is also evidence of an impact. Another popular theory that scientists use to explain mass extinctions is volcanic eruptions, and not just a little volcano like this. It's volcanic eruptions on a huge scale where the earth opened up and this molten lava came flowing out and spread over thousands of kilometers of the earth. And volcanic eruptions give off lots and lots of gases into the earth. So what would be the consequences of those? Large quantities of dust and ash in gases, blocking sunlight, causing cooling of the earth, and death of plants. And this would basically break down your ecological food chains. So again, animals would die. Alternatively, some volcanic eruptions give off a lot of carbon dioxide and hot toxic gases like sulfur dioxide, and this would cause global warming and acid rain, which would also kill off plants. So which one was it? We don't know. Could be volcanoes caused global warming or global cooling. Remember, there was nobody around at the time to tell us what happened. A piece of evidence for volcanic eruptions is in India. They have a huge plateau called the Deccan Plateau, which is two kilometers thick of flood basalt, which is basically from, this, from the lava that oozed out of the earth and spread over 500,000 square kilometers. That's a lot of lava. The third theory that scientists have, they said, no, it was actually the climate change. And there is also a bit of evidence for this because we do know that the Earth did go through several ice ages. And they reckon that it was the ice ages that actually caused the extinction of species in the different extinction events. Okay, how would this work? If there was a decrease in CO2, remember we did say that gas levels changed over time. It could cause global cooling. That would give us an ice age, which would decrease the sea level, increase the salinity of the sea, and because it's so cold, plants would not be able to absorb ice. So they would die, and then, of course, that would be followed by the death of animals. And Evidence for this is large areas near the North Sea are covered with glacial deposits. Okay, and this is an example of what ice leaves behind it. As ice moves, it picks up lots of stones, and when the ice melts, it leaves piles and piles of stones. Now, what we're looking at now is the five extinctions, and we're looking to see what effect did they actually have on animals and plants on Earth. How many different species became extinct? So, if we have a look at the first extinction in the Ordovician period, 86% of life on Earth died out completely. In the late Devonian extinction, 75% of species were lost. Then, this is the biggie. The end Permian extinction killed 95% of all life 
on earth. Quite mind-blowing. Then there was another extinction, which killed off 80%. And the extinction that we know about, the one that killed dinosaurs 65 million years ago, that only killed off 76% of life on earth. And mammals were some of those that actually survived. If we look at this, this gives us an overview of geological time, starting with, at the beginning, 540 million years ago, the increase in the diversity of life that we call the Cambrian explosion. During the Ordovician period, there, were, there was lots of diversification, lots of different species of animals arose, and then we had the first mass extinction, and that they're pretty sure is a volcanic eruption. That's the second mass extinction, 400, just less than 400 million years ago, and that scientists don't quite know. They're still arguing about it. The third mass extinction, this drop here, they think is a volcanic eruption. The fourth mass extinction, they also think was a volcanic eruption. And then this was the one that killed off the dinosaurs, they think was the asteroid impact. But remember, scientists are still arguing about what actually caused each of these extinctions. Then, some scientists are talking about a sixth mass extinction. But this time, it's not asteroids, it's not volcanoes, it's humans. The figures are very worrying because animals are going extinct at a rate not seen except in mass extinction events. And that is because of humans. Now, if we look at this graph, this shows the blue is how the human population has risen. And do you think it's an accident that exactly as the human population rises, the extinction rate rises? Now, why does that happen? Because I'm sure you don't kill off animals. You don't want to hurt animals. But it's the way we live. The number of people on earth, how much we use in the way of resources, how many natural areas we bulldoze to build houses, soccer stadiums and things like that which we need. The number of natural areas we plow up so that we can plant food to feed these huge numbers of humans. It's the amount of pollution we cause. It's the amount of plastic we throw down in the streets, which ends up in the ocean. And you do know what happens to plastic that ends up in the ocean. Turtles and other animals think it's a jellyfish and they eat it and the plastic get stuck in their digestive system, and they die. So what do you as a person do? The resources you use will have an effect on the world. Let's hope we don't push the world to the sixth extinction. Now, before your minds get too muddled, we need to take a break. See you later.
welcome back. What we're going to be looking at in this section of the lesson is we're going to be looking at fossils, different types of fossils, and there are a couple of different fossils that we will be looking at. We're going to spend a bit of time looking at a category of fossils that are quite strange that we call transitional fossils. We're going to look at some that we call living fossils, and then we're going to have a look at some of the interesting fossils that have actually been found in South Africa. First of all, we're going to be looking at things called transitional fossils. So what is a transitional fossil? Now, most times when scientists find a fossil, they look at it and they say, aha, that's a reptile, or aha, that's an amphibian, or that's a mammal. But there are some fossils that give scientists headaches because they have characteristics of two groups. And they kind of seem to be midway between the groups. They have been termed transitional fossils or sometimes called missing links. First transitional fossil we're looking at is an animal called Archaeopteryx, big word. This has been found from the rocks of the Jurassic period when dinosaurs ruled the earth. They found quite a few complete fossils and this is one example. And if they look at this, if you look at it, the head seems to look like a bird. It's actually got feathers, but the limbs and the rest of the skeleton are more like reptiles. So it's considered a missing link or transitional fossil between the bird and the reptile groups. Another interesting weird fossil that scientists had took a long time to work out, well, what is this? Okay, and this is called Tiktaalik. And that is found in rocks about 400 million years old. And this is what the fossil looks like. You can see there's the head, there's the legs, and there's the body. But this is actually like a fish. But if we look at it, does it look like the fish that we see nowadays? No, because it has some reptile or amphibian characters. Now, it's classified as a fish because it had gills, but it also has some characteristics of four-legged animals or tetrapods. You can see it has fins, but it would have been able to move around on land. And the reason why scientists think that is have a look at that leg. It's got a fin at the end so it could swim, but it's got a very definite leg. And if they look at the bones in the leg, they are more similar to reptiles and amphibians because, after all, fish don't actually have proper bones in their fins. And scientists reckon that having legs like this would have enabled it to move on land. For example, when the sea levels dropped and it found itself in a pond that was drying up, it could move. Another 
interesting translational fossil, which is actually found in South Africa, is an animal that they weren't quite sure whether it should be a mammal or a reptile. And that is called Thrinaxodon. So it's sometimes called a reptile-like mammal or a mammal-like reptile. And this is what they think it actually looked like. The next type of weird fossil that we have a look at are fossils which are called living fossils. In other words, animals that exist today that are almost exactly the same as fossils found 400 million years ago. They've hardly changed at all. And one of these that we're going to have a look at is a fish. Okay, and this fish is called the coelacanth. Okay, and it's regarded as a living fossil because it has remained almost unchanged. Whereas what we've seen, most organisms alive today are very different to those that lived in the past. So these are actually unusual. And we're going to look at the one example called a coelacanth. Now, these are the fossils of coelacanths that have been found all over the world, and they were well known as a fossil. But they were thought to have gone extinct 300 or so million years ago until fishermen actually caught a live one. And they were about to eat it, but somebody looked at this fish and thought, hold on a minute, that's a very strange fish. So they took it to people at the university, and they were amazed to find there was this fossil, and it was alive. And this picture shows you what the actual animal looks like. And if you look at it, it's very, very similar to what it looks like in the actual fossil. And since then, more of these have been discovered. And if you look at the picture, you can see they're actually quite large fish. And one of the reasons they think these fish have not changed is they live deep at the bottom of the ocean where conditions haven't changed for quite a long time. So they haven't needed to adapt. How long was that? Was it seven minutes? Yeah. Okay, so do I need to say we need to take a break? Yes. Okay, so. Before we look at any other fossils, I think it's probably time to take a break to give your brains a bit of a break. See you later. Welcome back from your break. We're going to carry on looking at different types of fossils, and this time we're going to be looking at some interesting fossils that have actually been found in our own country. So we are going to be looking at some South African fossils. Our country is actually very rich in fossils. Some have been discovered, but there are quite a lot more that probably remain undiscovered. The earliest fossils from cyanobacteria, billions of years ago, there's actually 
fossils of those unicellular bacteria, and they are found in the Barberton area. And this is what the fossil looks like. Quite honestly, I'm not quite sure how scientists know that these are definitely fossils of cyanobacteria, but I'm presuming that they look, have looked at it under a microscope and they can see some type of microscopic evidence that these are actually fossils of living organisms. Then, and these ones are really, really weird. In Namibia, they found fossils, and here are some pictures, and there's an artist's recreation. They look a bit like feathers. And scientists haven't been able to work out, is it an animal? Is it a plant? They don't know, because there isn't enough evidence from the fossils which actually tells us anything more about them other than the fact that they did exist all those millions of years ago. Then, there are other fossils that are easily recognizable because they have got enough information in the fossil. And in the Makanda area in the Eastern Cape, there are fossils, and you can clearly see that that is the fossil of a fern. It looks very much like some of the modern ferns we have nowadays. Now, these fossils are actually of a specific type of moss called a club moss. And there are lots of these fossils from that area, and they have been dated at having been formed 360 million years ago. Then, another weird fossil, okay? This is a plant called Glossopteris, found near Moy River in KZN. These are the leaves of the plant, and you might think, well, looks like an ordinary plant leaf. But this plant actually used to produce seeds on the surface of its leaves. Now, all the plants we know nowadays produce seeds either in cones or flowers, but this actually produced seeds on its leaves. And this is an artist's impression of what these glossopterists looked like. And there were huge forests of them. Then, some interesting animals. Elystrosaurus. Did I not skip? I Did I? Oh, okay. Sure. I didn't even pick that up. Thanks for picking that up. The back one. Oh, okay. So I need to clear that. Have I got the pen on? Oopsie, yeah, I want the pen on. Okay. Um, so now I've got to go back. Okay, and we're working on the board. Okay. Yep. We also found dinosaur skeletons in South Africa. For example, long name Euskelosaurus is a dinosaur found in the Eastern Cape. And this picture shows what it would have looked like. And if you look at those sharp teeth, it was probably carnivorous. So I'm very glad I didn't meet one of those. Then they also found some weird mammal-like reptiles. Remember, we talked about the one which was a transitional fossil called Thrinaxodon, and here's 
another one, Lystrosaurus. And guys, you don't need to know these names. But if we have a look, this shows us, this picture here shows us the fossil of the animal. And looking at it, it's got some characteristics of mammals and some characteristics of reptiles. So it's also considered a transitional fossil because it has characteristics of two different groups. Then, this is the cutie. It's about the size of a rat. It's called Megazostrodon. And this is one of the first mammals. And fossils of this have been found in the Drakensberg area. It was very, very tiny. And at the time dinosaurs ruled the earth, mammals were all tiny. Because if they were big enough to be worth eating, they would have been eaten by the dinosaurs. So the only ones which escaped being eaten by dinosaurs were very, very tiny ones which could burrow under the soil so they didn't get eaten. Then, this is an amazing one. Fossils have been found in the West Coast Fossil Park of a short necked giraffe. Okay, its scientific name is Civithia, but then of course you don't need to know the scientific names, but you just need to know that it's been classified in the same group as the giraffes, but doesn't have a long neck. And the picture we're looking at here, that is a recreation of this fossil animal. Just remember though, we actually don't know what its body looked like, what its colorings were. Scientists or paleontologists have just put that in because that's more or less what modern giraffe look, looks like. But the actual length of the neck they know is correct because they have the neck bones to actually show that. Did you know there were short-necked giraffes? Then, South Africa is very, very rich in early human fossils. And I'm sure you've heard of the Cradle of Humankind in Gauteng. It includes Sturkfontein Caves, where a lot of early human remains have been found, and in 13 other caves in that particular area. There's also the Maraping Center, which tells you all about some of the fossils that have been found in South Africa. And we're going to look at some of the early human or hominin fossils that have actually been found in our own country. Okay, first of all, early humans belonged to the genus Australopithecus. And they are early humans. In other words, they had characteristics similar to us, but they weren't like us. Okay, and a term we use for early humans is hominins. And one of these first discoveries was the skull of a child, which was called the Taung child, because it was found in a quarry in Taung, which is near Kimberley, and it has been dated from 28 million years ago. When this was first found, and it was called a hominin, people were very upset because they said, there was no such thing as primitive humans. Scientific evidence has shown us otherwise. Another example which is found at Sturkfontein is Mrs. Pless. You can see it's got a fairly small brain case and a nose that sticks out. And this is found in Sturkfontein and it's dated two and a half million years ago. Then, another hominin fossil 
is called Littlefoot, also found in Sturkfontein. And this was amazing because this was the first time they found a complete skeleton with its foot bones. That's why it's called Littlefoot. And its foot bones indicated that it actually walked on two legs. It was bipedal. Then, more advanced humans closer to us belonging to the same group that we belong to are the Homo genus, and they are the more advanced hominins. And some of these have been in the news in the past 10 years. You might have heard Homo naledi, found in Sturkfontein in 2015. And this is quite recent, 300,000 years ago. It has some characteristics similar to humans, but some characteristics similar to the primates, which are your giant apes. Then, another very important discovery, also made recently, is the Sediba child, or Homo sediba, also found in Sturkfontein in 2009, and it's dated 1.9 million years ago. And that is the discoverer, Lee Berger, and here is the skull still in the rock. But what they've done now is they have chipped away this rock. Okay, and they've chipped away the rock so that you can actually see the skull itself. And remember, the skull is now rock. Okay, it's very, very hard because it was fossilized and it's turned into rock. Now, what this is, this is a recreation. So they take the skull, they put muscles on it, and then they imagine and they put skin, eyes, and hair on it. And this is a recreation of what Homo sediba actually looked like. So two million years ago, humans looked like that. I'm finished. Is time finished? Have I still got two minutes? Okay, so, so, so then I should I just say my goodbyes? I thought I'd put, um, let me check. Oh, I thought I'd put, I neglected to put a, a concept map, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. And then I'm, I'm also, and then I'm also going to tell them that what I've told them, they actually don't need to learn. They don't need to learn the names of all these animals and things like that. As, as my goodbye. Okay, so I come back to the center again, should I? Yeah. I hope this look at some of South Africa's fossils have given you an idea of how interesting the heritage of our country is. The good news is you don't actually have to learn any of these. I'm showing them to you just to give you an understanding of our fossil history. For this section, also please check with your teachers to see exactly what you need to remember and what is just to give you the big picture. Because for this section, it's most important that you understand the big
big picture and not so much the names of all the different fossils. You need to understand the pattern of how things have changed over time. And I hope this has given you a good idea of how things did change. See you next time. Mm -hmm.